come together. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jane Ginn, and I'm the co-founder and president of a company called Cyber Threat Intelligence Network. We're a U US based company, but we have uh, co-founders across Europe and the United States. Um, what we're proposing for the Catalyst community is uh, to stand up a threat intelligence platform. And um, I see that I have it here now. So uh, not the platform, but a PowerPoint that will just help illustrate what it is that we're trying to accomplish. So I can share my screen if, um, do you need to give me permission? No, I think you should be able to do that. Okay. So let me do that. Okay. Are you all seeing the PowerPoint? Yes, we see it. Okay, great. So, um, I'm calling this presentation Insecurity in the Crypto Space because I, what I really want to do is just dedicate a short amount of time at the beginning to talk about the proposal itself, but then segue into some of the threats that we're seeing in the broader crypto space. Um, so here's the agenda for today's discussion. Proposal overview, I want to talk a little bit about the growing um, demand for implementing any money laundering and know your customer requirements um, for many of the different organizations that are providing services in the crypto world. I want to talk a little bit about the threat landscape and what some of the academic research that we're seeing is illustrating for us with respect to attack trends. And then I want to talk a little bit about how we can be stronger together by sharing cyber threat uh, observables, using a threat intel platform to do that, and then educating the community on why it's important. So what we're proposing basically is to stand up a threat intelligence platform. And we would like to use an open source tip that's been developed by an NGO in France called Luatex. I've given you here on this slide the, um, both their website and their GitHub site. Um, Julie, I'll, I'll make sure you have a copy of this PowerPoint so you can share it with your community. Our, the, the reason we selected this Thread Intel platform is one, because it's open source, and two, because it's based uh, natively built on the sticks. Um, 2.1 data model. Uh, STIC stands for Structured Threat Information Exchange. We're using the 2.1 version, which is an international standard uh, of OASIS Open, uh, another international standards body that uh, has been formed and has been actually operating for over 30 years uh, to promote open source standards. And we're on a track now to become an ITU standard, International Telecommunications Union standard, which is an agency within the um, United Nations. Our lead on standing up the open CTI will be David Rogers. And David has joined us here today. So if you all have questions after we're done, then, then he'll be able to, to answer those. This is a screenshot of what the dashboard looks like. You can do a lot of things with designing the dashboard to show what it is you're tracking and how it's distributed geographically, um, how it's distributed according to the data model and all of that. The, uh, that's too much granularity to go into uh, for this overview, but I'd, I'd be happy to get a dialogue going with people that are interested in that aspect of it. This is a screenshot of the public website for the STIX standard. I served as the secretary for eight years during the development of this standard, and I've just stepped down. And I'm now serving as the secretary for the Threat Actor Context uh, Technical Committee, 
where we've ta we're taking the STICS 2.1 standard and we're extending it into um, semantic technology space for use uh, in the global community um, using linked data and knowledge graphs. The second task in the proposal is to stand up a portal and our lead full for this will be Marco Jodovic. Um, we already have the website. We'll be uh, building a user-friendly interface that will allow for user registration and, uh, and make it easy for people to access the Threat Intel platform. We'll also be um, for task three, providing or developing training modules and we'll be publishing these on the uh, Cyber Threat Intelligence Network Training Center site. And these are self-directed online training modules, and I'll be taking the lead on this. And then we also have uh, a task, task four, that Mike Tybe will lead. Mike is the founder of Royally Good Digital. He's developed uh, a very short two two and a half minute video that uh, you can view at this link here, this bit.ly link. Um, and it's a very high level overview that uh, gives you that kind of the how and the why. And the whole purpose of doing this is to really socialize the idea of threat intelligence sharing and, and talk about why it's so important to, to share threat intelligence. So I mentioned earlier about the KYC and AML requirements. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, evident to anyone that's been participating in the crypto community how important these are because every time you try to, to uh, set up uh, an account on a, an exchange or, or anything, you have to go through the process for, for um, know your customer. But the reason that we're all being subjected to these requirements now is because we're seeing so much money laundering in the ecosystem. That's a very significant problem. And this is um, a graph from the Chainalysis Crypto Crime Report that shows how much cryptocurrency value was laundered from 2017 to 2021. So you can see we're dealing with very, very large numbers here. And, and these are tracked primarily by identifying the wallets that are engaged in illicit transfers. Um, this is an example of a U.S. Department of the Treasury, Department of Justice indictment that was issued against Park Jin Hook. Hook, I think is how you would say his last name. And he was indicted for the Sony Entertainment hack um, uh, where um, they were downloading many, many terabytes of data from uh, Sony, but were primarily um, disturbed about the movie called The Interview. Uh, he also also named in the indictment was his participation in, in WannaCry, which was malware that caused millions, actually billions of dollars of damage around the world. This was not just the crypto uh, community, but it was a ransomware attack. And then also he was named in this indictment for his role in an attack on the Central Bank of Bangladesh, uh, where they, he and his team stole 81 million. So this is just an example, a real world example of the kinds of things that are happening in this community, in, in the broader community. But when we narrow down, narrow it down and just look at the problems within the crypto world, um, we're able to see by from this uh, diagram here, we're able to see where some of the vulnerabilities are and what some of the attack patterns are. And for uh, 2019 through 2021, you can see that the DeFi protocols are, are being attacked. Now, recognize that this is data that's aggregated across all crypto ecosystems, not the Cardano ecosystem. And one of the objectives that um, the Cardano teams have established in developing 
Plutus and Marlowe and Ouroboros and all of the tools that we have within the Cardano ecosystem is to build um, security by design. So although we have those tools available to us within the Cardano ecosystem, all of us that are accessing these resources are accessing via traditional web 2.0 um, devices and networks. And there are so many uh, vulnerabilities associated with these devices and networks that it is important for us to recognize this, acknowledge this, and then start to share information with one another about this. So uh, taking this a step farther, um, the crypto crime context um, has really been uh, sort of um, has jettisoned <laughs> the activity in part because of international sanctions that have been uh, implemented against individuals and companies that are engaged in illicit activity. Um, it also has been jettisoned in part because of the anonymity of blockchain currencies. And, and, and I think that you see a lot in the literature, a lot of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt about um, blockchain ecosystems and cryptocurrencies in general because of the attacks against a lot of the, <coughs> excuse me, dApps or DeFi organizations, exchanges, and NFTs. So what we're seeing, excuse me just a second. So what we're seeing um, in the global environment right now is increased cyber attack activity by advanced persistent threat actors. And these are typically, we call them APTs. They're typically government sponsored, very, very well resourced and well educated uh, and well connected threat actor groups. Uh, that we also have very, very well resourced cyber criminal gangs that are targeting the crypto ecosystems and we have activists and other threat actors. So what I have also noted on this slide is that there is a, a, a very well-developed uh, framework that we will be using, we will be training on for the tip for collaboration proposal. And this framework is the MITRE attack framework. And um, what it, it provides is um, a very, granular taxonomy of what I call a modified kill chain. Kill chain is a terminology used in cybersecurity that indicates sort of a, a, a linear process of um, how an attacker gathers information on their targets and then executes their action on objectives. And it's a multi-stage activity. And what they've done, what MITRE corporation has done is build this framework where they have uh, compiled many thousands of resources um, into a database and then they've characterized the tactics and the techniques that the threat actors are using. And so we'll be able to train on this and, and raise awareness among members of the community about what to watch for. Um, so here's a little bit of data on 2021 and 2022 Q1 attacks. And I'd like to especially point out uh, an interesting attack um, on the Ronin network, um, which was an attack on a gaming platform called Axie Infinity. It's one of the largest security breaches that we've seen in the crypto community. Um, here it's cited as 615 million uh, of NFT, NFTs. And the way it was executed was through a series of phishing emails that targeted um, the node operators on the Ronin network. And uh, it just 
so it turns out that the Ronin network was highly concentrated, not highly distributed like what we're seeing in Cardano. And so the threat actors identified who they wanted to get to, and then they started courting those people, pretending to be recruiters on LinkedIn. So we call it in the cyber community, cybersecurity community, we call it social engineering. So these people were basically social engineered into thinking that they were going to be moving from their job, their great job at the Ronin network to a new uh, job with a much higher salary. But by opening a Trojanized PDF, one of the individuals that was being targeted um, was uh, uh, allowed uh, malware to be downloaded to his computer and then the threat actors then uh, were able to establish a beachhead in the network and move laterally through the network and, and then um, gain access um, to credentials that allowed them to gain access to, to the node. So this is uh, one set of attack patterns that we would be characterizing on the Threat Intel platform. Here's some more data from Chainalysis showing the um, how these DeFi platforms are being targeted. You're, you see even here in Q1 of 2022, we, we're seeing a lot of targeting of the DeFi platforms. And then this gives you a, a relative percentage of that same data. So you can see this is a very, very vulnerable piece of the part of the ecosystem that we need to make sure that we're helping to um, um, address from a, a, a security point of view. Here's some of the data on the Q2 attacks and um, some of the various um, organizations that have been targeted and the amount of money that's been extracted from the communities. So I'm going to give you a very specific example and some screenshots of a ransomware game called Trader Trader, and um, and they they're also known as um, Lazarus Group, APT38, Blue Nornoff, and Stardust Stardust Chomala. What you find when you're working in cybersecurity is that there are many different research teams, and when they start to see cyber observables on their networks, they then start to track those cyber observables and they establish a name for what it is they're seeing. And then when you start to compare across these silos, then you're able to then correlate the attack patterns of these various threat actor groups. And that's why you often see multiple names for the same attack pattern, the same threat actor group. This is a screenshot of a threat intelligence platform called TrueStore. This is not the OpenCTI one, but I, I wanted to show this to you because it is a good illustration of how we'll be using a graph-based database at the back end. And this is actual data from the Trader Trader um, uh, exploit, which was published in um, March of this year. And what you see here is the report that I uploaded. These nodes all represent various what we call cyber observables. Which So these are the IP addresses and the hosts and the domain names that are associated with their malicious infrastructure. And then all the other nodes that you see up here are enrichment sources. So I've configured an application interface with other enrichment sources. So then they are able to display whenever um, we have data on a new exploit that's going on. Now here's a virus total uh, depiction of some of that same data where I have the hash value of an executable that was the executable that was part of that PDF that got downloaded. And um, so you see how we're able to, threat analysts are able to go into these graph databases and, and then use the information to drill down, drill down, drill down on what the threat actor is doing and then try to deduce what the tactics, techniques, and procedures are of the threat actor. So in summary, what we want to do is start to profile the real threat actors that are attacking the Web 2.0 and Web 3.0 infrastructure 
and we are interested in protecting the critical infrastructure resources being used by the Catalyst community. So with that, um, I will now um, give you a second if you want to take a screenshot of this information and be in touch. Um, but I, I will make sure you all have this um, PowerPoint as well. And I will stop sharing. Oh, good. I see Ashton has shared the OpenCTI link. And I will stop sharing and so we can open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Jane. It was uh, super interesting. I will definitely need this presentation in order to share that as well as your details. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, Um, okay, I have one. So what are the most of, uh, so, uh, because many, uh, many people currently are interested in NFTs and particularly women, like they're most interested in NFTs. What, and I, I already heard a couple of threads about NFTs. What are the, the most often threads? Um, well, the, the Ronin network is a good example because Axie Infinity was a gaming platform um, that was uh, providing NFTs for the uh, play to earn activity. And, and so that um, I saw the last figure I saw it was $540 million worth of NFT value that was stolen by that during that hack. And that was the Axie, Axie Infinity gaming platform on the Ronin network. And I see there's a question from A, a hand raise. Yes, uh, I, sorry, I, I wasn't sure whether to raise my hand after you'd finished your answer or not. Um, so should I go ahead and ask now or? Yes, I, I finished my answer. Okay, cool. Um, awesome presentation, I think um, cyber, Security is super, super interesting. Uh, yeah, so I suppose just from a bird's eye view, um, what are your impressions of the sort of current existing um, efforts? You know, I'm thinking of like chain analysis, for example, like, um, you yeah, know, what are your thoughts in terms of the current approaches? For um, reporting on attacks or for aggregating data or um, what, what would you I like suppose, me to comment on? Um, well, I suppose uh, <laughs> uh, if you could give some idea um, on sort of all three phrases of, you know, um, detection in the first place uh, slash prevention, uh, and then also, you know, subsequently investigation post, um, you yeah, know, post event. Okay. Okay. So one of the technologies that, well, I won't call it a technology from the point of view of a hardcore uh, technology, but rather from a social political um, framework um, that this social political framework that it has emerged um, in the community, in the uh, defender community, is this whole notion of setting up information sharing and analysis organizations or ISOs. And with what these organizations do is they provide a mechanism for setting up a, a threat intelligence platform like this and then sharing information across um, organizational boundaries. And so in order to do that, because of the need to protect intellectual property and to avoid antitrust and to protect, um, you know, be it compliance with GDPR in European countries, et cetera, et cetera. In order to do that, there needs to be uh, a, some sort of vetting of members that um, join that ISAO. And that's basically what we're, we're proposing to do with setting up a tip for the Catalyst platform. Uh, that being said, within an ISAO, uh, we'll be able to share 
best practices that have emerged around detection, which is really what a tip is all about. Prevention, which is um, a, another conversation about how to uh, establish best practices around configuration controls, around training, around um, uh, orchestrating responses to attacks so that you can, so that individuals and organizations can respond in real time. Um, and then investigations, that's uh, another whole area. Uh, you've, I'm sure many of you have heard of uh, forensics, um, computer cyber forensics, digital forensics, and those uh, investigations are also important in a post-breach uh, situation because uh, many times there are lawsuits and so the in investigations have to occur in order to substantiate uh, the activities of a threat actor uh, during a, a breach. Does, does that help? Is that useful? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, quite useful. Um, if you don't mind, I've just got a quick follow up. Um, you mentioned the Ronin network, and uh, I suppose just uh, as a general reference, all the uh, compromises that Ethereum network has had. Um, to me, it uh, it occurs to me that when one kind of breaks down um, how to possibly problem solve here. One of the things um, that ought to be sort of considered is the underlying technology or the, the, the underlying technology and sort of the approach um, to how it is architected. Because um, I feel like for the most part, what happened, um, you know, with uh, what, what's been happening in the context of Ethereum uh, in the bridges and uh, sort of layer twos is a fundamental um, architectural problem. So I feel like, you know, perhaps, you know, there's something to be said uh, for the amount of work and just sort of inefficiency, um, say compared to an architecture like Cardano's um, UTXO and uh, how sort of stake pools are sort of, you know, set up um, and that kind of thing. So yeah, uh, uh, I feel like there's something to be said for, you know, um, the technology standpoint. Um, the sort of other bit that I wanted to talk about here is Obviously, you know, when we talk about attacks, the technical attacks, which in this case, you know, sort of more code uh, related, then the other side is the social side, right? So you've got, you know, phishing and, you know, social engineering and, and, and you know, this kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm curious where, um, where you kind of, Obviously, you've mentioned, you know, sort of the, the vetting process. So, you know, that's sort of, in a way, kind of like a tertiary leg, which is which doesn't really speak much to the technical or the social so much as it sort of speaks to um, engaging with whether it's governmental level um, uh, institutions or private industri industry and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I'm just curious whether... Yeah, whether well, they've given some thought to solve the technical and the social um, side of things and how that plays into uh, the tip. I see that David Richards has um, placed a comment in the chat panel. David, do you want to comment on on what A has has um, asked here? Yeah. So, with a lot of you know attacks that we see, the Rona network is a good example of one. A sophisticated group that, uh, you know, was social engineered. So um, they basically came through the back door. So if you leave a door open, the, the attackers can come in and and that's a people problem. And so, you know, part of that is making people aware and educating people on what, what could happen. Um, we want to, you know, part of like the awareness, security awareness is teaching people to have some um, intuition about what they're doing. So, um, you know, when you open an attachment that that starts prompting you to to install something or say something, we want people to think before they they act on that. So that's really a big part of of understanding, um, you know, like indicators of compromise or what what threat groups are doing, 
is is teaching people how to to work around or not fall for their tricks. Hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I mean, that's 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 part of the reason why you know I asked you know about the sort of the balance between the uh, the the technology and um and the social, because unless I'm mistaken, the Ronin thing was um uh was uh sort of social engineered through this whole like interview fake interview process, and um you know at some point um a PDF was sent over to be signed, and that PDF you know had you know some malware or something in it. Um, I, I might be thinking of a different case, or it, it might be their own in um situation. Is oh, okay. Um, yeah. So obviously, in this case, uh, I don't. I, I tend to see it as both, right? Um, you know, it's it's a bit like a car accident, where you know, um, you know, the safety features, right? If you build a car well, kind of thing, or if you don't build a car well, like ultimately you know it's a sort of a and, and to kind of zoom it out like with self-driving this kind of becomes even more complicated but I, I, anyway i just kind of wanted to i suppose get you know some some thoughts around you know that balance and um and i suppose the costs as well because you know going back to the whole architecture thing where the elegance of um how um you know Charles and uh, and Duncan and uh, Agalos and you know and team have architectured Godano. I feel like fundamentally, people even even if you look at stakeholder operators, right? People are thinking about security, you know, from the ground up and are aware of you know um, possible breaches, you know, and, and that kind of thing. And that even translates to how you know, like the non-custodial nature of um, staking. Um, yeah. I think a car analogy is really good because you can have a beautiful uh, car that's got all the safety features in the world, but if you drive too fast or you don't take care of the car, you're going to introduce um, problems into your your driving situation. And that's what we happen we see with with security is you know people do dumb things or they don't take care of their their equipment. Um, you know, as simple as patching your your computers, um, you know, cause cause problems. You're basically driving too fast or or being erratic when you when you do that in the cyber world. So, um, I think the car is a really really good analogy. You can have great technology, but if you do, um, you know, dumb stuff, it's gonna uh, come back to haunt you. bit.ly link in the chat panel. It's bit.ly 3P6OPD6. And that will take you to a short article on the CTIN Training Center website and that two, two and a half minute video that further explains what it is that we're trying to do here. Um, yeah, those, those points you're making about the Cardano ecosystem is what we call in the cybersecurity world, security by design. And, and really my point in the presentation today and in my objective in submitting the proposal to the community is to raise awareness about security by design because it's not just technological security, it's also sociological security. And that has to do with awareness among the community about the vulnerabilities of their networks and their devices and their minds. You know, um, there's a whole kind of subcategory of work that's being done within the cybersecurity community about influence operations and what could be called mind hacks with disinformation and misinformation. And so, you know, we it's humans that are so vulnerable. And um, so anyway, that's that's another topic for another day is are there any other questions or comments are you planning to continue um I, uh, to have uh, other training uh, courses uh, so this is a proposal for fund nine but uh, um, I think it's quite important what uh, David I think said about the education of uh, 
people being aware of this, it, it is a huge, uh, huge um, thing and it, it is a most of, so I'm curious to know if you plan any other trainings. Yeah, I already have three trainings up there. One is on STIX 2.1. It's an overview of the, the data model that underlies the open CTI platform. Um, I've also got one that is just a high level overview of some of the mind maps or uh, analytical models that we use in cybersecurity. And then I've got one on best practices in a security operations center, which is um, a 24 7 365 watch center for organizations for real time attack patterns. So I've got three up there. It sounds like from the questions that we're hearing today that we may need some other presentations on best practices for for securing uh, perimeters, uh, securing um, uh, communities, um, taking more of a defensive posture. And then we also may, may need some you know, kind of overviews of what um, some of the driving forces are in, in uh, digital forensics investigation. So those those are great those are great questions and great thoughts. Uh, I have I will note that I've been going to some of the Emergo Academy presentations and I've reached out to one of the presenters who has suggested that we may want to in a subsequent fund uh, form uh, join forces and um, and extend the tip functionality that we're now uh, proposing to set up on a cloud platform in the web 2.0 space um, they're thinking we may even want to extend this into the web 3.0 space so that would be a subsequent uh, phase if, if we move forward yes uh, we do have i see a question here in the um, chat panel, we do have one other member who sits in Eastern Europe. I think it's quite late his time. So it looks like he didn't log in. So what is the best place to contact you, Jane? Um, LinkedIn or email? Um, yeah, I, I'll share my screen again and, um, and share that contact information. If anyone, let's see. I think I have to share my screen first. Okay. Yeah, JG at cyberthreatintelligencenetwork.com. And then I also put my LinkedIn profile there. And then we also have uh, the LinkedIn um, profiles for all of the team members. I do want to give a shout out to Mike Taib, who is the um, graphic artist, the creative artist, and the video editor on our team that will be doing the, the uh, videos, the YouTube videos. He's uh, an award-winning documentary filmmaker. He won the Audience Choice Award at uh, Los Angeles International Film Festival, as, as well as an editor for a number of different um, cryptocurrencies, uh, reviewers in cryptocurrency space. So he's well versed in, in the cryptocurrency arena and also has built a, um, a collection that's up on OpenSea. Mike, do you wanna say anything? Hi everyone. I have a kind of a different pseudonym on, on all my crypto stuff, but yeah, I've got a long background in uh, video production, uh, motion graphics. So those are the little lower thirds that pop up with name titles or stingers that go in between um, transitions on videos, the kind of graphic elements that, that make uh, videos flow. And yeah, um, I think that everyone's so excited about cryptocurrency and uh, one thing that is heavily overlooked is the security of your assets, whether it's uh, owning your own keys. We've seen recently with um, uh, 
centralized services like Celsius and Voyager going down um, all the way to hacks like Jim was talking about with Axie Infinity. And I, I think this is a very base level um, implementation that needs to be done within the industry as a standard. Yes, I see Jonathan uh, posed a question here. I, I was just trying to kind of get, wrap my head around the whole sequence of activities you need to go through in order to submit a proposal. So my first proposal was, my first ideation step was called security standards for collaboration. And um, I didn't follow through with that one. I morphed into the card, the tip for collaboration with a greater emphasis on standing up the tip because the standard itself really sits behind the tip and right. um, and is used to to model the threats. Nice. And while well, I'm on, um, so I guess, do you, do you have an idea of what the proportions are, technical vulnerabilities versus social engineering, um, you know, successful attacks? Oh, cross chains. There's a lot of good data about that in the cyber security community in general. I've not seen any breakdowns among the researchers that are just focusing on the blockchain, but um, I certainly want to dig into that in the mm. future because I think that's going to be necessary as we build out the training materials. Mm. But in, in general, in broadly in the cyber security security community, it's typically um, anywhere from 60 to 70 percent um, social contingent on on human uh, failure, human vulnerabilities, human susceptibility to to social engineering. Mm. And it, it kind of strikes me as well. That that's that's actually more of a, a user interface, user experience um, process, really. So making sure our dApps are um, doing the same sort of things as the banking apps do now um, and verifying who you're sending to, putting questions in your face all the time, asking, are you sure you know what you're doing? Poor little thing. <laughs> and there, um, one of the, one of the disc, one of the um, project catalyst proposals was around um, social uh, design, um and all to do with ui ux um, i just joined the discord so i'm very new to it but um it looks very interesting um and that would probably be a good place to try and you know create some influence because really you want your tip to be embedded as a you know an add-on to a lot of these apps that come out um so people can just directly see and be aware of you know maybe it's pulling news feeds on current threats and um you know awareness is half the battle isn't it um to solve some of these problems so, um, one of the things i'll point out to this group of attendees is that um shortly about two days after i submitted the proposal and i listed one of the digital assets that we'd be using that site started to come under a very intensive brute force attack brute force password cracking attack. And I collected all that data and then I shared that data with with um, various communities that I share with, in, including the IOHK folks, to let them know that there are some trolls that are in the Catalyst community, or I I have to qualify my, uh, my words here. Um, I deduced that there may be some control some trolls in the Catalyst community because of the timing of that uh, attack pattern. And hmm. so I, I harvested all of that data. And then I also have been doing some hunting on that data. And what I found, I, I haven't dug very deeply, nor have I published on it yet. But what I found is it, it appears to be um, a initial, what we call initial access broker that's trying to gain access to that website so it can harvest data on the users and and this is uh, often these initial access brokers will harvest that data and then they'll sell it as a database on a um, 
in, in on the you know dark web cyber criminal <laughs> hacking forums on, on the dark web so um yes i see mm. a saying they're among us yes <laughs> they are and that gets back to that question that you posed earlier a about vetting um i think this really goes to the heart of the whole governance question that Charles has raised and that um, the community is dealing with in, in a very systematic manner. Um, so that I don't have an answer yet, but I am certainly going to continue to learn what I can from this community about how to do that properly in this context. Any other questions, comments? Uh, is it Juliana? Juliana, how do I pronounce your name properly? Yes, yes, everyone struggles with that. Juliana. Juliana, Juliana. Okay, I, I turn it back over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. If we don't have any other question, I think uh, we have to keep it short under an hour, which is great. So, uh, short productivity discussions are super interesting. I will definitely. Uh, share your presentation wherever I can and um, I will be in touch actually also in terms of uh, educational materials and how we can uh, create more awareness and uh, educate more more people uh, on this. Thank you for sharing.